kick off. So, as I said, welcome. Today's, inf um, today's inflammation, today's webinar is all about inflammation and oxidative stress. So, as you're probably well aware, these two things tend to go hand in hand with one another. We see oxidative stress where there's inflammation and we see inflammation where there's oxidative stress. And that's something that I think is relatively well established. However, when we come to look at the research, when we come to look at our clinical approach, and when we come to look at nutritional interventions for both inflammation and oxidative stress, up until very, very recently, they've been considered quite separate entities and they've been approached as quite separate entities. So what I want to do today is talk through how they're linked, the relevance of how they're linked in clinical conditions, and also to help you to understand what we need to be thinking about and what we can do in a clinical setting to make sure that we're doing the very best by our clients. So. I sought long and hard to find the perfect definition for the paradox that I was trying to explain when it comes to the link between inflammation and oxidative stress, but I think this statement sums it up pretty well. So it's a contradictory yet interrelated issue that exists simultaneously and persists over time. And this is exactly what's going on with this link between inflammation and oxidative stress. So what is inflammation? Well, those of you that know Igenus will know that we talk a lot about inflammation and today is no exception. I'm going to focus a bit in on that as well today. Um, so we know that inflammation is a defensive immune response and it's promoted and initiated by the innate immune system. It culminates in symptoms such as heat, redness, pain and swelling and is triggered by this recognition of PAMPs and DAMPs, these pathogen or damage associated molecular patterns. They're recognized by receptors on our circulating immune cells and this then triggers the release of cytokines, chemokines and inflammatory mediators so that we can then have this initial immune response that we know and love as inflammation. The trouble is, as with so many things in modern illness, is that it can get out of hand. And inflammation on the whole should be naturally switched off, the body should sense when enough is enough, and the stimuli should go away, and inflammation should switch off successfully. But more often than not, this doesn't seem to be happening. And what we get is this accumulative tissue damage, an ongoing triggering of further immune activation, further inflammatory drive, and we get what's known as chronic low grade and often termed silent inflammation. And that significantly increases our susceptibility to illness and long term diseases. So a really important thing to note when it comes to understanding inflammation and how the body switches it on and knows when to switch it off is that this process is all determined by our eicosanoids and our eicosanoids are these hormone-like inflammatory signals that drive the inflammatory response but also resolve the inflammatory response so something going on in our biology something going on at the cellular level needs to recognize firstly when to initiate inflammation when enough is enough when to start flipping the switch so that it's no longer pro but anti-inflammatory eicosanoids that are being delivered and when to terminate things completely. And we see as a result of this imbalance and we see as a result of this um, shift not being as effective as it should be, a huge chronic inflammatory drive in pretty much every modern illness that we're experiencing today. So oxidative stress then is um, driven by an imbalance in our reactive oxygen species. And reactive oxygen species are actually quite natural, they're quite normal, we all have them, and they're generated by byproducts of cellular metabolism from the electron transport chain through to detoxification processes and um, cellular respiration and NADPH oxidase, so ATP um, production. They're also produced similarly to inflammation in response to damage to the cells, to stressors, things like infection, exercise, pollutant exposure, sunlight, radiation, cellular respiration again there because that 
creates an oxidative stress and a, a, creates free radicals. Inflammation directly creates oxidative stress, as well as, as I said, detoxification and um, environmental chemicals and, and internal chemicals like um, applying uh, chemicals to the skin or cigarette smoke and things like that. On the whole, healthy human beings are actually able to keep our oxidative stress in check via our inbuilt antioxidant defenses. But sometimes the balance of this pro to antioxidant status can shift in favor of the pro oxidants, and then we see oxidative stress. So over the years, oxidative stress has actually evolved in terms of its definition. And initially, it was thought of simply as that imbalance between pro-oxidant status and our antioxidant defense systems. But now we're starting to understand that it's not just about the imbalance, but it's also about a disruption in the redox signaling as well. So today, oxidative stress is understood as the imbalance between oxidants and antioxidants that lead to a disruption in redox signaling and then subsequent loss of control of that signaling and that balance, which can then ultimately result in molecular damage. So it's not just about having high levels of pro-oxidants and not having enough antioxidant defenses, but it's about the body's inability to actually switch on further ways in which to create antioxidant defenses. And that imbalance together with the loss of ability to manage and adapt to the pro-oxidant status is what causes oxidative stress. So when we look at the role of oxidative stress in illness, the main issue here is that uncontrolled and excessive reactive oxygen species, that is the hallmark of oxidative stress, has the potential to significantly damage all of our biomolecules. So everything from proteins, DNA, lipids, carbohydrate chains, everything that makes up us is susceptible to oxidative damage. And that can ultimately lead to functional impairment so that things no longer behave as they should or just are dysfunctional completely, which as you can imagine, subsequently impacts the, the biological mechanisms and the activity of those um, structures but also ultimately it can lead to programmed cell death if the body identifies that the cell is no longer functioning as it should then apoptosis will be induced so when we look at the specific damage and impact of free radicals to different structures we see the likes of carbohydrates oxidative damage can result in chain breaks and this becomes problematic when we look for example at um, cell signaling so if the carbohydrate chains that are linked to our lipids lipid membranes are broken then the cell signals can no longer be recognized and the cells get lost they wander off and they do crazy things um, and this disrupts communication between cells but we also see it in things like um, the joints so hyaluronic acid and glucosamine for example they're carbohydrate chains and if they get broken their structures are no longer as they should be and then we start to develop things like joint stiffness pain arthritis DNA, free radical damage directly damages the DNA structure, which can cause mutations in the replication of DNA, but it can also um, cause complete strand breaks, meaning that the replication process can't happen. So as you can imagine, DNA damage can result in insufficient cell replication, it can result in incorrect cell replication and ultimately um, cancer if it progresses with a mutated cell. Then things um, damage that affects proteins, we end up with a problem with the processing of proteins. So the proteins aren't in their correct structure, they can't carry out their correct functions, but also the body's not able to recognize them as they should, and you can't clear them, you can't eliminate them. So even if the body realizes that this thing is in here and it's not doing what it should it might not be able to understand quite what it's meant to do with it or it might not be dysfunctional enough that the body recognizes that it does need to do anything about it so these proteins can start to build up in our tissues and our brain and cause um, clogging effects and things like beta amyloid plaques 
one thing to be aware of in terms of oxidative stress in illness is that antioxidants themselves, whether they be the ones that we make or whether they're the ones that we consume in the diet, actually have the capacity to become pro-oxidants. So if they are in the presence of reactive metals, these antioxidants can react, swap hydrogens and electrons, and themselves they will become a pro-oxidant. If an antioxidant doesn't have any backup, as it were, so it's reacting, it's quenching free radicals, but there's nothing to take the hit thereafter, this chain reaction carries on. So the antioxidant itself will actually become a pro-oxidant in quenching a reactive oxygen species. And also when we have really high levels of antioxidants, we can suppress reactive oxygen species to such an extent that that becomes a problem um, and we end up with a pro-oxidant derived from antioxidant levels. So similarly to chronic inflammation, we're starting to understand, or perhaps we've understood for a very long time, that oxidative stress is also linked and plays a huge role in the driving of these modern issues that we weren't seeing sort of 100, 200 years ago quite so much. So everything from cancer to cardiovascular illness, specifically atherosclerosis, because oxidative stress is heavily implicated in cholesterol um, dysfunction, diabetes and the complications associated with diabetes are hugely linked to oxidative stress. And then things like aging, arthritis and neurological disease have a massive pro-oxidant um, drive associated with their, their onset and severity. So as I mentioned at the beginning, something that we often don't pay attention to from a practical perspective with both inflammation and oxidative stress is how linked they are. We see them as two separate entities and, and the clinical approaches tend to be quite individual. Yes, there's definitely some crossover in terms of your recommend an anti-inflammatory agent which will have antioxidant capacity but it's normally targeting one direction or the other or one pathway or the other but when we look at the research we're starting to understand more and more and more and more that perhaps the successful targeting of both inflammation and oxidative stress individually needs to be a joint effort. We need to be thinking about both of these processes and the huge number of mechanistic factors and pathways and underlying issues that are driving and, and exacerbating both of these um, disease contributors in order to really have a significant clinical benefit. So when you do a simple PubMed search, which you can see just here in the corner, I've done exactly that. Inflammation and oxidative stress brings up 24,615 results and that's just one really simple search term I'm not going into specifics at all here and um, sifting through a lovely 20 pages you can see that oxidative stress and inflammation is linked to fatty liver, beta cell dysfunction, so insulin resistance, diabetic complications, aging, hypertension, kidney disease, more kidney disease, cardiovascular issues, and atherosclerosis. So it really is quite a significant thing to start thinking about the interdependence of these two um, chronic, potentially very detrimental processes and how we can be addressing them concurrently in our clinical approach. So with that in mind, um, and I found all sorts of hilarious and some quite rude cartoons to, uh, to use here, but I went with this one because I thought it was quite apt. What came first? Was it cute little chick here or was it the egg? We need to be asking this question when we're looking at the clinical approach to oxidative stress and inflammation. So in order to understand this, first let's look at how inflammation can cause oxidative stress and vice versa. So inflammation directly causes reactive oxygen species production. It's actually central to the progression of the inflammatory response. And the reason for that is that inflammatory cells produce reactive oxygen species, which then act as signaling molecules to further mediate the inflammatory response. So it's saying, 
here's an inflammatory response, the cells are liberated, and then the cells go, okay, I need more, I need backup, I need more people to come and help me, I'm going to generate some reactive oxygen species, I'm going to cause some oxidative stress, which will send out signals for more people to come and help me. At the site of inflammation, the generation of um, free radicals is one of the major ways in which the body starts to break down and, and target the specific tissues and cells that need to be removed and eliminated. The actual process of triggering a pro-inflammatory response, which is stimulated by the linkage or the, the activation of these receptors. So we've got the toll-like receptors, the nod-like receptors, and the receptors to, um, and I always go blank on this one, the receptors to the um, glycation end products, advanced glycation end products. So they're rages. Um, when they recognize and bind PAMPs and DAMPs, you activate the transcription factors on the genes that causes a pro-inflammatory expression um, of cells and, and chemokines and cytokines. And that in itself, when more than one toll-like receptor in particular is stimulated by these PAMPs and DAMPs, you will get an imbalance of cytokine production and that will directly generate reactive oxygen species as well. Also, um, in the presence of both the pro-inflammatory messenger in interferon gamma, as well as lipopolysaccharide, which is one of these in inflammatory components of bacterial cell walls, you will get reactive oxygen species again. And finally, macrophages. Macrophages actually come in two types. So you get M1 and M2. M1 is involved in the pro-inflammatory drive. And reactive and um, sorry macrophages will actually use oxidative stress as a way to directly eliminate pathogens too so by creating oxidative stress and cell damage that will then signal apoptosis and cell death so that those pathogen infected cells can be eliminated and removed successfully so then looking at it the other way around, we've got pro-oxidants and their existence, as I mentioned before, is actually as a stimulator for signaling cascades. So we get um, inflammatory gene expression being switched on and upregulated in the presence of excess pro-oxidant levels. We've heard a lot hopefully from my genus, but also elsewhere in the literature about NF-kappa-beta, which is one of these main transcription factors, these main um, pro-inflammatory drivers. And this, the transcription and production of NF-kappa-beta, again, is directly stimulated by both oxidative stress and that imbalance in the cellular redox status. So as soon as the body is recognizing that there's an oxidative load that it can't necessarily cope with, it will switch on genes that produce inflammatory messengers. Reactive oxygen species can damage mitochondria. This will activate the NLRP3 inflammasome and that leads to interleukin 1 beta expression. When DNA is damaged by reactive oxygen species, the cascade that's um, initiated as a result ends up switching on pro-inflammatory gene expression again and you also get subsequent accumulation of inflammatory cells which we now know the inflammatory cells themselves use reactive oxygen species and oxidative stress to cause further damage and cause elimination of the cells that are no longer functioning as they should and that will obviously cause further oxidative stress. Eight isoprostane is a peroxidation product of arachidonic acid and it's often used as a marker of oxidative stress and its present also acts as a signaling molecule to switch on the expression of the pro-inflammatory cytokine into leukin 8. And then finally, um, if 
molecules in our plasma of certain amino acids, certain proteins, certain um, nutritional factors such as cysteine are oxidized. This will trigger monocyte adhesion, so inflammatory cells that are already circulating around. If there's some damage to the components of the plasma, they will then adhere to the vascular wall, to the cell lining of the vessels, and that will activate inflammation in that vicinity. So hopefully you can start to see that they are both sort of self-perpetuating and inter-perpetuating and inter-exacerbating and inter-stimulating processes. And the key really is to understand, like I said, which one came first. When you've got oxidative stress as the primary problem, you're undoubtedly going to get inflammation develop and vice versa. So what can we do about these? Well, the nutritional approaches to both inflammation and oxidative stress seem relatively straightforward and they're pretty well established. So when we're thinking about nutritional approaches for inflammation, we need to revisit that idea of the eicosanoids. And we need to go back to understanding what produces eicosanoids, what affects the balance of eicosanoids, and it's all down to the balance between omega-3s and omega-6s. So by having the right ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 in our diet and in our cells, we can directly, positively or negatively, if your diet is in balance, impact our ability to initiate drive and switch off and terminate the inflammatory process via eicosanoids. So the key fats to be aware of when it comes to the inflammatory process is arachidonic acid. That's the main pro-inflammatory mediator. And basically phospholipase A2 enzyme comes along in response to an inflammatory signal, cell damage, infection, injury, it will take arachidonic acid out of the cell membranes and then COX and LOX enzymes are used to convert the arachidonic acid into these pro-inflammatory eicosanoids and that then results in inflammation starting. So what we need to start thinking about is how to downplay this arachidonic acid cascade. If we have huge amounts of omega-6 in our diet, if we don't have enough omega-3 relative to the omega-6, we end up with far too much arachidonic acid being produced and the inflammatory drive just persisting and persisting and persisting. If you remember back to that chart I showed of the um, resolution of inflammation, the switch from pro to anti-inflammatory is determined by the switch in the types of eicosanoids available. So if we don't have enough omega-3 to produce those anti-inflammatory products to counteract the level of pro-inflammatory, then it's never going to fully resolve. So up until this point, we've talked about omega-3 versus omega-6. We've talked a bit about arachidonic acid, but of course we need to be thinking as always about specific fats involved in these processes. So usually, and then a lot of the research, and it's where we see a lot of problems with the research, you get omega-6 versus omega-3, and there's not a huge amount of differentiation. Obviously, that's starting to change tremendously, but when it comes to eicosanoids specifically in balancing the pro and anti-inflammatory drives, we need to be looking at the ratio between EPA and arachidonic acid. So it's not just about the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3, it's specifically arachidonic acid to EPA. And the reason for this is that EPA is really the only fat that can counteract the pro-inflammatory eicosanoids derived from arachidonic acid. EPA is used to make less inflammatory versions of the eicosanoids that arachidonic acid is used to make, but EPA can also directly displace arachidonic acid from cell membranes. So the balance between these two fats is vital if we really want to look at the initiation from a nutrition perspective of pro-inflammatory issues. So, talking about oxidative stress then, and the nutritional approaches to that, 
it sort of goes without saying, and I probably didn't need to, to specify this quite so directly, but of course we're looking at antioxidants. So antioxidants are the substances that will directly neutralize free radicals and reactive oxygen species um, or their actions. We have endogenous antioxidants, which are the ones that are made inside of us. And then, of course, we have the exogenous sources, which come from predominantly our diet. So the endogenous ones are generally enzymatic, things like superoxide dismutase, glutathione peroxidase, etc. And these are there ready and waiting to buffer any changes in the redox status of the cell. So these are the ones that can react to stimuli. If an increase in peroxidant drive comes along, if oxidative stress starts to become a problem, then these enzymatic antioxidants can be upregulated, their activities can be switched on in order to combat that and we can adapt via these mechanisms to target excessive amounts of free radical production. Then we have the non-enzymatic which traditionally are the ones that we would get through the diet so we're, they're not necessarily ones that we can make ourselves we would consume those and obviously on the whole non-enzymatic antioxidants are um, we have a finite level of them at any one point so unless you're sort of able to acutely be aware of oh there's some oxidative stress about to happen in my body quick I'm going to go and eat a ton of antioxidants um, the body only ever has sort of that that absolute level available it can't upregulate those without an external source so one thing to be really aware of when we're thinking about the, the roles of antioxidants and the clinical approach to antioxidants is the different stages of this reactive oxygen species and oxidative stress process at which antioxidants work so again going back to this concept of inflammation and oxidative stress being separate entities we tend to think of antioxidants just being antioxidants right they're all the same they all just do antioxidant stuff they run around mopping up free radicals sorting out oxidative stress and protecting our cells from subsequent damage but actually there's three steps in this process that they can function we've got prevention steps so some antioxidants such as superoxide dismutase actually directly act to prevent the formation of reactive oxygen and nitrogen species in the first place then we have the interception phase so these are the what i would call the sort of typical antioxidants the ones we think of as those that come from the diet that we consume they're running around mopping up free radicals they're giving electrons donating hydrogens taking them back and swapping them with each other so that they can calm down any oxidative stress that is already present and then finally we have certain antioxidants um, which again are mainly enzymatic and we tend not to hear quite so much about these that run around um, and repair damage caused to target molecules so these are the things we already know about clinical interventions and about the role of both omega-3 and antioxidants in the diet. We know that when we look at the studies, there is an inverse relationship between tissue or plasma antioxidant and phytonutrient status and chronic illnesses as well as all-cause mortality. We also now know, thanks to a wonderful wave of recent research, that an omega-3 index, which is the sum of your EPA plus your DHA, um, is above 8%. Then you've got a significant reduction in all-cause mortality. A diet rich in plant matter, obviously equating to greater than your five a day, as well as eating at least your two to three portions of oily fish a week is also known to confer significant protective and positive health benefits. So why, in light of those quite profound um, understandings and, and, and knowledge of what's going on in our body, why are we getting so many negative results? Why are we seeing people constantly publishing papers about how useless fish oils are and how you shouldn't waste your money on antioxidants and micronutrients and all of the things that we otherwise would in inverted commas know is good for us well 
In order to answer that question, we need to look at it in a few different ways. Firstly, we need to look at um, the inconsistencies in the studies themselves. So those of you that know me and that have been to um, talks or lectures of mine in the past will know that this is a major bee in mine and Dr. Bailey's bonnet about how terrible a lot of the, the research studies that are being published actually are. Not only are human beings from a, a you know an individual basis so fundamentally different but at any one point all of the confounding factors that impact us can be tremendous they're almost infinite if you think about stress sleep exercise diet environment the air that we breathe you know everything there's so many different factors that can be impacting how an individual is going to respond to a specific intervention it makes it really, really difficult to actually design an effective study. When we look at omega-3 specifically, there, there's no exception. There's a huge variation in the study design that's looking at omega-3s. The background diets of the participants are dramatically different. Each study is using a very, very different endpoint. So you may be looking at 25 studies that are all looking at inflammation for example but if some are looking at crp some are looking at interleukins some are looking at um lymphocytes or monocytes you're going to get a very different outcome and you're not going to really be able to compare one study to another we're also often not looking at baseline fish consumption or those people that do eat fish regularly are removed so you're automatically removing a significant portion of the population and so this variation from study to study in terms of design already has a dramatic impact on the potential outcomes of any meta-analysis that we can look at people that are recruited into these studies are quite often, again, up until recently, recruited regardless of the baseline omega-3 or any nutrient status they have. So it's currently not common practice to screen people for their nutrient status, despite that then being the intervention. So if you don't know what someone's baseline omega-3 levels are and you're giving everybody a fixed dose, how are you going to know whether or not individuals are going to respond and to what extent they respond and what it is that they're responding to specifically? Frustratingly, again, um, up until quite recently, the majority of trials that have been used in, in meta-analyses and systematic reviews have used quite low doses. And we're starting to see with the more recent wave of studies that you need quite high doses for clinical changes because most people have low omega-3 status. Other things to consider are the drugs that they're taking. A lot of populations, particularly in omega-3 studies, are taking medications that we now know directly impact the potential benefits of the omega-3 fats. The inter-individual variation in terms of response to omega-3 is also tremendous. So I already mentioned the, um, the, the potential for numerous confounding factors from one person to the next within the same population study. But even on a, a, a sort of micro scale, when you look at how dramatically or how much change somebody will see in their omega-3 levels by the same omega-3 intervention, there's an up to 13 times difference from one person to the next is the potential variation. So there's absolutely no way of controlling for that inter-individual variability. And if you wanna know more about that, Dr. Bailey has covered it many, many times in previous um, webinars that she's done. Something else to think about, not just in relation to fish oils, but antioxidants as well and nutrients in general, and something that most of us are quite well aware of, is that not all fish oils are the same. So we need to be thinking about the concentration, we need to be thinking about the form, we need to be thinking about the delivery system. And we need to start using biomarkers much more often. So when we look at all of those factors, it's kind of any wonder that we actually ever get any positive results from omega-3 studies. And it's a similar, similar problem with oxidative stress and the use of antioxidants to target oxidative stress. One of the key issues um, 
identified by um, Mr. Nikki here is that more often than not, oxidative stress is not the cause of disease, but it's a consequence. So oxidative stress is normally a subsequent impact of something going wrong. If something's not right, if the cell is under stress for whatever reason, then reactive oxygen species are generated at a greater rate. If our bodies can't keep up with the, the demand for antioxidants, then oxidative stress ensues. So it's not necessarily the key trigger, it's not necessarily the, the initial factor, but it, it's, it's a problematic consequence that further drives and exacerbates things. Something, again, that we need to be conscious of, which I've sort of touched on already, is the importance of understanding that each antioxidant has a specific role. So it will target specific pro-oxidants, it will have a specific mechanism, it will have a specific way in which it functions, and it will function at a specific point in the oxidative stress process. So if we're just expecting to combat the entirety of oxidative stress damage and, and problems associated with one or two high-ish dose antioxidants, it's highly unlikely that you're actually going to see significant positive outcomes. Again, lots of the studies included um, people that don't actually need antioxidants. So they might have a healthy antioxidant status. And so giving them a specific antioxidant, one that they don't need, is not necessarily going to result in any benefits. Something that's obviously really key in coming out more and more as we move through personalized nutrition and into um, individualized support protocols is understanding not only the right type of intervention and dose of intervention, but whether or not we're giving it at the right time in the etiology of the disease. Sometimes the interventions that we're using, we're doing it based on the, the absolute best mechanisms but it may already be too late and obviously we're seeing as always prevention is better than cure but if we're not targeting the right pathways with the right nutrients in the right doses at the right time we're not going to be seeing significant positive improvements so there's so many factors that we need to be thinking about when we see all of these negative um headlines and these negative studies coming out um, but one thing to be aware of when it comes to meta-analyses and systematic reviews is they are umbrellas so they look at the overall messaging for an area of science and by definition they they can't look at the periphery they can't look at the specifics they can't look at the new and the emerging science because they're relying on well-established large population studies that are ideally randomized they're not looking at the intricacies so we we start to by relying so heavily on randomized controlled trials and meta-analyses we start to actually um reduce the picture and and cut out a lot of the peripheral exciting and perhaps more explanatory um, mechanisms and understanding of what really might be going on so a conclusion from Mr. Nikki here is that antioxidants should be beneficial when given to the right subject at the right time. And as I say, that's, that's really key. The right intervention for the right person at the right time. So what we also need to take into consideration is the important aspects and the essential roles of inflammation and oxidative stress when we're trying to understand why these clinical interventions aren't working. Inflammation is an essential process. We need it as our first line defense against injury and infection. Without inflammation, there will be no wound healing. We would die from pathogen overtake. We'd be invaded and every cell would be destroyed by pathogens. So we need inflammation to remove those pathogens from our body. It's also a protective thing. In the early phases of infection or injury, the area swells you have reduced mobility, you get pain, and subsequently that tells you to stop, rest, stop moving it, stop putting additional stress in force. So it's a protective thing as well. And of course, inflammation is the trigger for adaptive immunity. So if our inflammatory response can't deal with the injury or infection, then 
we will adapt an, an immune response that hopefully will be able to deal with that. Oxidative stress is also vitally important for so many processes in our body. Signaling molecules, which I've already alluded to, nitric oxide, for example, is a vasodilator. So it's essential for enhanced blood flow, for helping us feel relaxed. Um, so really, really necessary for stimulating a lot of positive processes. It's also massively involved in adaptation, not only adaptation to oxidative stress, but things like adaptation to exercise, which I'll talk a little bit more about in just a moment. One of the reasons why um, plants taste bitter is because of their phytonutrient content. So the phytonutrients are the, the plant's own antioxidants that are developed to help ward against the stresses that a plant will face throughout life. So in theory, the more revolting your fruit and veg tastes, then the more antioxidants it's got. No, not quite, that's not quite true. Okay, so or oxidative stress can also trigger antioxidant gene expression. Sort of goes without saying, if you've got an increased oxidative load, you need more antioxidants, so you need to be able to switch on those genes. But we're not going to be able to adapt and improve without the oxidative stress signal in the first place. Interestingly enough, hydrogen peroxide is actually necessary for thyroxine synthesis. It's needed as a catalyst to the enzymatic bonding of iodine to thyroglobulin. So we're not going to have sufficient thyroid function without at least some oxidative stress and uh, free radicals present. It triggers apoptosis, so a damaged mitochondria or a damaged cell will send out reactive oxygen species as a, a distress signal almost, and then that will be recognized by um, immune cells and the cell will be degraded and apoptosis will ensue. I've mentioned detoxification already, but oxidative stress is involved in removal of, of toxins and xenobiotics. And it's also important for mitochondrial biogenesis. So reactive oxygen species will actually trigger, as I've mentioned already, that adaptation process to increase our um, respiratory capacity and make the cells stronger and more able to, to function in stressful conditions. So with the um, positive and necessary roles of oxidative stress and inflammation in mind, it starts to make sense that if we're suppressing inflammation or oxidative stress either too early, too aggressively, or too long term, it can lead to exacerbation or extension of the individual symptoms and possibly long term clinical conditions as well. So this is just a couple of studies that um, Dr. Bailey and I have come across recently that have started to show this in clinical practice. So this is a really interesting study that when um, Nina waved this under my nose, I was like, oh my God, that, that's really profound. We, we need to talk about this to people. We need people to know what's going on here. But what they found was that a low dose, and I say low dose, but actually 0.5 grams of EPA plus DHA daily is quite high for the majority of people who won't be supplementing with omega-3s or eating fish. But this low dose of EPA and DHA was able to improve the outcomes of the body's immune reaction to dealing with specific infections. And these are infections that induce a very strong inflammatory response. And if we look at the specific infections, a lot of them tend to be things that um, can be chronic, can be quite severe. So if we're suppressing inflammation um, at an, a low level, we're giving the body what it needs to be able to resolve the inflammation once it's done, but not suppressing it to a point where we're switching off the body's ability to adapt. So when we then look at the next bullet point, it shows that a higher dose of one to two grams daily of EPA plus DHA in certain um, experiments, some of which in animals, some in human beings, found that there was actually a detrimental outcome on the um, expression and the, the severity of those infections. There was also um, some further research that they included in this study looking at respiratory and systemic infections, 
that were as a result of intracellular pathogens. And again, they found that omega-3 supplementation at higher doses was problematic and actually detrimental in terms of supporting the body's ability to eliminate these pathogens from um, infected cells. And their overall conclusions were that omega-3s, because of their immunosuppressive properties, don't allow the body to carry out that inflammatory and elimination process as it needs to at the right point. They're anti-inflammatory, and a lot of the time, inflammation is absolutely critical for the host's response and survival to injury or infection. So one specific example that they gave in their, um, their summary was host protection against flu virus. So that actually requires neutrophils, um, NK cells, so natural killer cells, T lymphocytes, as well as the expression and secretion of lots of inflammatory and antiviral cytokines. By giving too much omega-3 too early in the process, they found that it was over-suppressing natural killer cells, lowering the body's immunity and ability to combat those infections. So it's a really, really lovely, but also quite scary um, illustration of the importance of the right dose, the right intervention at the right time for the right condition. And then this is a, uh, an example of a, the, the problems with antioxidants. We're seeing a lot in the headlines at the moment. Antioxidants are a waste of time, they're a waste of money, don't take them, they could be problematic. But again, it's about the right intervention at the right time. And this was a study that looked at um, chronic dosing of vitamin C and vitamin E in combo in relation to exercise. So it looked at pre-trained and untrained individuals, gave them all a um, thousand milligrams of vitamin C plus 400 IU of vitamin E daily, as well as made them all do the same exercise regime. And what they found is that over the course of a few weeks, the use of antioxidants daily suppressed the body's natural adaptation and positive um, core mitohormesis, so the generation of new mitochondria and improved cell responses to state of stress by giving these antioxidants. On the flip side, um, the same study mentions in its um, discussion that studies have looked at acute dosing of antioxidants in exercise and found that just giving the vitamin C with or without the vitamin E on the day of exercise rather than every day can reduce the tissue damage associated with um, delayed onset muscle soreness, a reactive oxygen species and causing pain without negatively impacting the adaptation. So again, it's about the right intervention, the right dose, the right dosing structure at the right point in that intervention. This then, again, you know, antioxidants and cancer is sort of a, a majorly controversial area. In theory, oxidative stress is hugely um, linked to progression of cancer, but also antioxidants in a lot of studies have been shown to exacerbate things and make things worse. So we need to understand the biological context in order to understand whether an antioxidant is going to impede or promote uh, tumor growth and, and tumor cell and cancer cell proliferation. Um, and this study just talks about the use of N acetyl L cysteine and vitamin E in an animal model, granted, but again, it's kind of early mechanistic stuff and showing that actually its use um, increased tumor and genesis and so made it worse basically. And we see this, you know, we use radi radiation therapy for the treatment of cancer. If you're taking or recommending high dose antioxidants alongside cancer treatments, then you can actually directly switch off the oxidative stress that the radiation is going to cause. And it's the oxidative stress that will ultimately kill those cancer cells. So we really need to start getting into the mindset of understanding the environment in which we're trying to, to have an impact, but also the specific point in the process at which we're trying to intervene and whether or not it's right and that specific intervention is right at that time. 
something else that we need to be really kind of uh, keeping on our radar as it were and being conscious of when we're recommending specific either um, specific anti-inflammatory interventions in particular is that actually in the presence of oxi oxidative stress lipids are likely to be quite widely peroxidized as i said in that earlier slide um, any biological molecule in our body is potentially able to be damaged by oxidative stress but lipids in particular are really really susceptible so if we're trying to combat an inflammatory and oxidative stress based condition and we're throwing high dose concentrated omega-3s at it which is probably something that hygienists would otherwise tell you to do um, then we're going to be fanning the flames because you're putting in polyunsaturated fatty acids. These are the most likely to be oxidized because they're the most unstable, they've got the most double bonds, and you can just be adding to the problem. And, and this, together with um, the last few slides that I showed you, are um, a number of different reasons why we're, we're seeing so many negative and, and conflicting studies coming out of this approach this nutritional approach so just to quickly sort of review the process of lipid peroxidation for those of you who might be unfamiliar with it as I mentioned lipid membranes are highly susceptible to oxidative damage and basically a reactive oxygen species will damage a lipid in the bilayer of a cell or floating around in the body such as in uh, lipoproteins and that will trigger a chain reaction and this full chain reaction which you can see down in the bottom here is called lipid peroxidation and basically you end up with the generation of all of these lipid radicals which themselves are able to then go and take electrons and, and hydrogens from other lipids and they're constantly sort of going around breaking each other down and causing more and more radicals and it's this sort of massive snowball effect so if we don't have the adequate antioxidants to terminate that lipid peroxidation chain reaction, then it can sort of keep going and going and going and spiraling out of control. Now, the problem with lipid peroxidation is not only that when our lipids are oxidized, that's going to affect cell membrane function and obviously um, lipid transport, like I said, um, cholesterol, LDL, for example, um, the functioning and the recognition of those so that they'll be stuck in the system and, and unable to carry out their biological mechanisms. But it also creates a lot of toxic byproducts. So we can end up with quite wide reaching damage being caused by all of these peroxidation byproducts. So it really is something that we need to be sort of acutely aware of when we're thinking about the nutritional intervention and even pharmaceutical interventions for oxidative stress and inflammation. Um, so this was a really interesting study. Uh, basically, this was looking at the beneficial role of DHA, so the longest chain polyunsaturated omega-3 in the uh, family. And they found that on the whole, DHA is obviously a beneficial thing for brain function, brain structure, and preventing beta amyloid plaque buildup. But all it took was for 1% of their DHA to be oxidized for that positive impact to flip. And all of a sudden, that DHA becomes a problem. And they saw significant increases in beta amyloid production as a result of oxidized DHA. This, again, lovely, interesting study, a meta-analysis looking at the link between major depression and lipid peroxidation, and they found a significant correlation between levels of lipid peroxidation and not only major depressive disorder, but also the symptom severity of major depressive disorder. So bearing in mind that one of the major breakthroughs recently in natural approaches to depression and in general approaches to depression, because pharmaceuticals tend not to be that great for most people, is this huge inflammatory basis. EPA in particular has been found to be really fundamentally useful for the treatment of clinical depression. But if we're throwing EPA at these people and there's high lipid peroxidation potential, we could be exacerbating problems. 
And then, of course, there's all of the scandals that have been um, coming out of the likes of New Zealand and then more recently the US that basically show that in a lot of encapsulated fish oils, there's already hyperoxidation products and the concentration of oils or the non-concentration of oils, but basically the dosing of oils in isolation can further add to the amount of oxidized lipids that are being put into the body. So if there isn't significant consideration for the oxidative stress status into the environment in which you're adding these lipids, it can um, exacerbate rather than help people. So Hopefully you're now all terrified and thinking, oh my goodness, I'm killing all of my clients. What am I going to do? I'm going to have to wander off, take them all off antioxidants, take them all off um, lipids and, and pharmaceutical um, fish oils and, and basically just hide, <laughs> which is sometimes how I feel when I do this research. But Fear not, there are ways in which we can progress safely and we can have some significant positive impacts on our clients' health. Of course, as always, diet is the best place to start. Not only because it's the most natural way to do it, but because of the huge variation and the, the broad array of nutrients that you can expose your clients to by shifting their diet. And I'm preaching to the converted because I'm hoping there's not a single person on this webinar that will be not addressing somebody's diet. But actually, maybe we need to be thinking a little bit more tactically about okay, I know that a diet rich in phytonutrients, I know a diet rich in wild oily fish is going to be really beneficial, but specifically which phytonutrients am I going to be increasing? And using foods a little bit more therapeutically than perhaps we would have done to just set the foundations of an optimal well-being diet. So if we're looking at people with cholesterol problems, for example, we might be thinking, um, obviously beta glucans, which not only help to lower cholesterol, but also have a major immune stimulating benefit and offer lots of antioxidant potentials as well. Medicinal mushrooms together with lots of um, lovely homemade turmeric curries in people struggling or recovering from cancers so we really need to kind of be drilling down even further laying these strong foundations putting in some specific functional foods because each functional food is going to have a huge array of nutrients that will offer significant antioxidant and anti-inflammatory benefits without really needing to do um, anything so targeted the other thing that um, is becoming increasingly important in these more complex and intricate settings is really just understanding what's, what's going on at a biological and physiological basis. I have always had a little bit of a love-hate relationship with functional testing in that I work with quite a lot of people here in Cambridge who don't really have the money to test and they don't see the value in testing up front and everybody wants to do it without testing but in a lot of situations if you don't know a exactly where the dysfunction is what level of dysfunction somebody's experiencing and then what specific intervention they actually need you're going to be stabbing in the dark for so long that you could end up exacerbating things so I would strongly recommend um, if you can and some of these tests are more expensive than others um, and some I would prioritize over others depending on the situation that you're dealing with but please 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 test people's fatty acid levels what you want to understand specifically is the omega-3 index and the AA to EPA ratio if that's all your test tells you that's fantastic um, because that in itself is going to give you a huge insight into the body's um, and the cell's inflammatory capacity. If your AA to EPA ratio is out of whack and your omega-3 index is on the floor, the amount of control that you have over the bit, your ability to regulate this inflammatory process is going to be slim to none. So there's a huge risk there for long-term chronic illness. Oxidative stress-wise, um, there's there's loads of tests out there um, and it's really important to kind of do a little bit of research to understand which biomarkers are going to give you the most information. 
whether you're looking at specific antioxidant status, whether you're looking at the levels of enzymes to tell you how much oxidative stress is going on, whether you're looking at metabolites, whether you're looking at cofactors, all of these different tests are going to give you slightly different information. So whilst I can't give you any sort of definitive, you should test for this, 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 and this, I'd have a real um, a, a sort of a good think and a good look around to see what tests people are offering to understand, well, what phase in this process am I looking at? Am I looking at the acute phase? If I'm looking at the acute phase, perhaps I'm not so worried about... Um, antioxidant status but I'm looking at the, the severity of the inflammatory load the severity of the oxidative stress load and I want to know whether it's an enzyme insufficiency that might be causing the problem I want to know whether it's mitochondrial damage I want to know whether it's nutrient deficiency so there's there's lots of different things to sort of just start putting your thinking caps on and really play detective with these things to understand where you want to go and, and what's really going to give you the information because just blanket testing everything is expensive um, but also for a lot of people it's unnecessary if there is a huge inflammatory load and you're thinking omega-3s then it might be useful to look at the lipid peroxidation um, metabolites and obviously dose with specific antioxidants which we'll talk about in a moment that will help to combat that perhaps even in advance of doing any specific omega-3 intervention so I just want to really hammer a couple of things home because I've been having this conversation with practitioners a lot recently and it's something that myself and Dr. Bailey are both sickened and terrified by on a regular basis. Um, but it's also a good reason to plug the Igenis Optio 3 fatty acid profile. Um, basically, Igenis is pretty much the only lab I think in the world that not only gives you your omega-3 index, your omega-3 to 6 ratio and your AA to EPA ratio, but we actually use that data to tell you exactly how much omega-3, specifically EPA and DHA, your client needs to get to what is considered an optimal omega-3 index. By doing that, that will significantly benefit their AA to EPA ratio. So that in itself is a wonderful reason to use Igenis because we can make sure that the dose you're giving your client is correct. We can recommend the right fats to achieve those levels without taking excessive amounts of lipid that are going to exacerbate peroxidation. We can help you to understand whether or not pure EPA in the early phases is gonna be more beneficial. DHA down the line once you've got oxidative stress under control and your lipid peroxidation potential is much reduced. But the main thing that we're really struggling with and that we're getting, I have to admit, we're getting quite upset and anxious about is the use of reference ranges um, that are completely inaccurate. One thing you have to bear in mind with um, a lot of labs is that if there is no such thing as a scientifically validated optimal level for a nutrient, which thankfully in the case of the omega-3 index and the AA to EPA ratio there is, then the reference ranges that you're being given, whilst they give you a guidance as to what system might be under stress, what might be struggling, you shouldn't be aiming to bring a client into a specific barrier, into a specific range, because those numbers might not be right for your client. There might be a reason why your client is at the peripheral end of those reference ranges. So if the analyte that you're testing doesn't have an absolute value, if it's um, so if, it, if it's just a, a relative value, so relative to everything else that's going on rather than, so obviously for vitamin D, for example, we get an absolute value of milligrams per deciliter. So you know, there's a scientifically validated optimal level for that. For most things, especially more cutting edge things, there isn't. And we're seeing this a lot with fatty acid testing. Labs are reporting their individual fats. They're not reporting them as a percentage, which is the measure 
that all of the research has been done on. They're reporting them as um, all sorts of weird and wonderful different things, but they're also giving reference ranges and the reference ranges are not based on any scientifically validated optimal levels. They're based on purely the people that have been tested by that lab. So it's really important and I appreciate that I'm sort of I'm flooding you with lots of responsibility and lots of reasons to now be terrified in your clinical practice. Um, but it's really important when you work with a lab that you understand some of their processes and how they get their reference ranges. You understand whether or not there actually is a scientifically validated optimal for that individual figure um, and whether or not the, the data that they're using to produce those reference ranges has any any sort of clinical weighting as it were. So at the moment when you use our Optio3 test we won't give you a reference range for all of the individual fats. We only give you the values for what is scientifically validated and proven to have a clinical and health impact on your client which is the indexes and the ratios. What we are trying to do is build our own guidance chart based on epidemiological studies that contain hundreds of thousands of healthy people from both the UK and Western populations. So it's important um, when we are looking at reference ranges to make sure that we're looking at a healthy population. We're looking at people that don't have inflammatory based illness. We're looking at people who aren't struggling with conditions that we know the specific biomarker that you're measuring for is likely to be impacted. And that's often not the case with specific labs. So I just really wanted to hammer that home. And I'm not saying, you know, we're the only lab that, that does anything good but I am saying you, you really with specific things you need to be careful and I know for a fact there are tests out there where they will suggest that the reference range for omega-3 is between 10 and 15 when actually if your omega-3 index sorry your AA to EPA ratio if your AA to EPA ratio was between 10 and 15 we would actually say you're at very high risk of inflammatory based illness the omega-3 index in some tests is also the reference range so the green bit of the reference range is between sort of one and four when actually we know scientifically that you should be above eight percent at least above five percent if you want to reduce your, your risk of chronic illness so please 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 be careful when you're choosing your labs um, and don't necessarily just trust every lab to do it to do it right have a chat with them, understand their processes and understand where those numbers are coming from. Okay, moving on from my, my semi-informed rant. Um, for those of you who do want to delve a little bit further into the specific biomarkers of oxidative stress that might be useful for that particular client, then I suggest this paper as a good starting point. What this paper does is it looks at all of the different impacts of reactive oxygen species and oxidative stress in the different systems, the different areas, and then the different biomarkers that can be used to understand the processes. So obviously, if you've got somebody who's at high risk of cardiovascular illness, you probably want to be testing for their um, oxidated um, LDL um, and other lipid peroxidation products, among other things. So it's about sort of being targeted, being specific, looking for the right markers relevant to that, that person. Okay, so we've talked about testing, we've talked about the interlink between oxidative stress and inflammation. We've talked about why we shouldn't always be suppressing them aggressively. So now let's look at just a few of the emerging proven nutrients that we can start to rely on. So we've got omega-3s, obviously, and lots of the lovely studies are showing that omega-3s have a positive impact not only on inflammation when given at the right dose, at the right time, to the right person, um, but also have a positive impact on oxidative stress as well. So we Igenus in people who are under high oxidative stress low, we would probably recommend starting with a high EPA intervention or even a pure EPA intervention. That removes the element of potential lipid peroxidation, which is most 
which is of most concern for DHA in the early phases. We don't want to be mega dosing. So if somebody's just gotten a virus, they're new to an injury, they're just out of hospital, that inflammatory process needs to be happening. The body needs to be doing that. So we do not want to be suppressing that. But some low level day-to-day -day healthy doses are really, really beneficial in terms of making sure that the body has what it needs so that when it's ready to make that eicosanoid shift, it can and it can switch off and it can resolve inflammation successfully. Hopefully then you won't be getting to the point where you need to be worrying so much about the AA to EPA ratio and chronic inflammation because you'll have dealt with it efficiently at the root. However, if you're working with people with chronic illness, with systemic inflammatory issues, then we need to start testing. We need to look at the specific fats that we're um, that that person needs. We need to look at the specific dose that they need to get to optimal for them. And that's where the Optio 3 is important. Um, and unsurprisingly, we're starting to see even more so, ignoring all of those weird and wonderful negative um critical reviews and meta-analyses that have come out about omega-3s as a whole. When we look at specific interventions at the right dose and interventions that raise the omega-3 index to where it should be and address the AA to EPA ratio at the same time, we're seeing huge improvements to all of these chronic inflammatory conditions. For those who can't test um, or who you just need to sort of get in there quick, they're Nina again in her um, December webinar on separating fact from fiction about EPA and DHA covered a lot about the optimal ratio between EPA and DHA. We would on the whole recommend no less than two to one EPA to DHA. So three times as much EPA as DHA. So you've got um, 250 milligrams of DHA daily, which is time and time again proven to be sufficient and adequate to support the body's systemic needs for DHA with an additional 750 milligrams of EPA on top. That would be our general sort of guideline intervention um, omega-3 starting point. If you don't know what specific dose somebody needs, you're worried about giving them too much or not enough, that would be a good place to start. Lots of research has shown that actually going as high as 6 to 1 EPA to DHA is even more effective in more long-term chronic omega-3 deficient disorders, and specifically when there's um, lipid issues at stake as well. So there's, there's oxidation, there's high triglycerides, high LDL, things like that. But in all cases, EPA in excessive DHA is, is vital and optimal. Be aware that DHA is actually able to retroconvert back to EPA. So if you're worried about giving loads of um, EPA or you know worried about DHA and somebody not needing it, then they can support one another. So um, it, it's just something to sort of factor into your equation when you're thinking about the specific doses of each fats. But if you do do the Optio 3, or even if you don't do the Optio 3 and you just want some advice on what fat at what dose and what ratio, please feel free to give us a call. And we do recommend monitoring as well. So if you can test um, at the outset to get their initial dose, fantastic. Make dietary modifications, add in oily fish and retest sort of six months 12 months and then at least sort of annually just to make sure that you're in the right place because things fluctuate as you know so many different factors in our lifestyles today can increase oxidative stress and inflammation so it's good to keep on top of it and here's just some lovely studies showing that when you specifically delve in, you get to the root, you dose with the right EPA or DHA dose, and you look at the levels of those fats in the cells, people whose cellular levels of EPA and DHA specifically are elevated to a point um, which is known to be positive for health, we do see a dramatic positive impact on all cause mortality. So we're not just talking specific CBD or depression or Alzheimer's, we're talking all cause mortality just by being specific about the levels of fats that we're achieving and the types of fats that we're giving. 
And then this was the most recent, um, which I think just came out a month or so ago, which was a prospective cohort study, including 6,500 women between the ages of 65 and 80. And they measured their polyunsaturated fatty acid levels, looked at their omega-3 index, which is the sum of EPA plus DHA in your red blood cells. And they found that women with the highest EPA and DHA levels were the survivors. So the lower your EPA DHA levels, the more likely you were to die within um, 15 years of the onset of this trial, regardless of the cause. This is all cause mortality, which is pretty profound. So another wonderful nutrient that we're hearing huge amounts about in the nutrition world at the moment, and which Dr. Bailey in particular is very excited about, and she did a lovely webinar earlier this year all about curcumin, is curcumin. Um, and one of the reasons we're hearing so much about curcumin is because when we look at its mechanistic impact, it has such wide reaching potential benefits that it's hard to see why you wouldn't include curcumin even at a, a low sort of day-to-day -day dose, but impacting everything from inflammatory transcription, antioxidant and inflammatory enzymes, all of the kinases involved in metabolic and adaptation pathways, inflammatory cytokines. So curcumin has a huge, huge biological potential to um, impact both inflammation and oxidative stress, and all of the positive adaptation processes that go along with that. One of the main targets for curcumin is the suppression of the activation of NF-kappa-beta. So curcumin has this direct ability to interact with the receptor that locks into NF-kappa-beta and activates it so that it can then go on to drive the inflammatory and oxidative stress responses. So we can see here by this lovely diagram that um, these can all be um, linked to high NF-kappa beta activation. So by targeting NF-kappa B, we can hopefully have some positive impact on these conditions. And that's just a, a nice summary of um, some of the specific clinical benefits associated with the use of curcumin. And again, please make sure that whenever you're using specific interventions that you revisit the current knowledge base, that you look at the trials. I thoroughly recommend examine.com if you want an up-to-date evidence-based, um, quick, easy review of um, specific nutrients and their applications in different areas. Again, they take quite a meta-analysis systematic review approach, so you won't always get the peripheral um, information, but it's a good place to start. So make sure that you are giving the right dose of the nutrient for the, the condition and the dysfunction that you're aiming to treat. Coenzyme Q10 is, um, again, one of these areas that we're like, oh yeah, I know all about coenzyme Q10, yeah, it's great, but actually it tends to sort of get forgotten and I don't, I'm not seeing a huge amount about it and not many people are kind of raving about it, but when we look at this necessity to approach both inflammation and oxidative stress as a concurrent process, then coenzyme Q10 can be absolutely fantastic and thus far, I'm not aware of any studies that are showing any potentially negative impact of coenzyme Q10, um, specifically in the ubiquinol form. And that's because it can be used both as an antioxidant itself, but it can also help recycle antioxidants. So it helps prop up the body's natural antioxidant capacity, but it's also used in cellular energy. Uh, so cellular respiration by the mitochondria. So it's, got multiple different functions, which means it's not necessarily ever going to be hanging around being a nuisance and causing problems, whereas other high dose antioxidants might be. One thing to be aware of with coenzyme Q10 is many of your clients are going to try and be sneaky. If you recommend coenzyme Q10 to them, they're going to wander off, they're going to buy a bottle that's cheaper than what you might recommend otherwise, 
but unless it specifically states that it's ubiquinol and it should be Kaneka, because I believe they're the only source of ubiquinol currently available in supplement form, it will be ubiquinone. Now, 96% of the body's coenzyme Q10 status is in the ubiquinol form. And this is the active, ready to be an antioxidant, ready to go, ready to support the electron transport chain form of coenzyme Q10. So it's really important that in people with a high oxidative stress load, together with an inflammatory basis, that coenzyme Q10 as biquinol is the specific form that we're recommending. And this is just a nice little diagram showing how ubiquinol can not only donate electrons to quench free radicals, but it can also donate electrons to other antioxidants that were spent, as it were. So it's an antioxidant recycler as well as a free radical quencher. So it has a really, really nice profile of activity there. Um, and we see in clinical studies that a ubiquinol deficiency is directly linked to mitochondrial function and antioxidant status. And by having low ubiquinol levels, we get a lot of free radical generation and we see low CoQ10 linked to, again, all of these areas that we're also seeing linked to oxidative stress as well as inflammation. Um, this was a really interesting study, again, one that I pinched from Dr. Nina Bailey, um, but basically showing that ubiquinol specifically at a relatively low dose of 150 milligrams per day was able to not only provide its antioxidant capacity, but to directly reduce inflammatory processes. So if we're thinking about the need to suppress this double whammy impact, then Anything that is able to, to combat anti um, to combat oxidative stress effectively, as well as impact and reduce the inflammatory process, is is a winner. Um, and then this again was just a, a really nice um, meta analysis that showed supplementation with coenzyme Q10 was able to reduce a number of inflammatory cytokines in statistically. Um, significant levels and that the antioxidant um, capacity was independent of the anti-inflammatory capacity so it's quite exciting to use there vitamin e now vitamin e has gained a bad reputation because of all of those early cancer studies that showed that it was problematic and there's still a little bit of a sort of the jury is out situation in terms of vitamin e supplementation but when it comes to lipid peroxidation and when it comes specifically to um supporting oxidative stress in an inflammatory context when you're giving long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids then optimal natural specifically alpha tocopherol status is really really important so um, i would invite you to revisit the idea of um vitamin E and just making sure that clients um, alpha tocopherol status is optimal. Now the majority of decent fish oil supplements should contain this form of vitamin E by now. If it doesn't, I'd avoid it. And then we've got resveratrol. Resveratrol again is another one of these beautiful antioxidants that's popping up everywhere and starting to be linked to all sorts of things, not just because people are thrilled that they're getting some health benefits from their red wine, but because it has so many positive impacts on so many different pathways. And again, we're seeing this synergistic antioxidant and anti-inflammatory benefit from using resveratrol. So it has a huge potential to impact lots of conditions where, where both is um, a driving force. Lipoic acid, again, similar situation. Wonderfully um, beneficial in obesity, pain, inflammation and aging in animal models um, and has the ability to, much like CoQ10 recycle antioxidants, specifically vitamin C and E. So it helps to prop up that overall antioxidant pool, which is great because we want multiple different directions to come at oxidative stress from, but it also has lots of lovely um, anti-inflammatory benefits as well. Now, quercetin was one that um, I've not really 
thought about from a sort of um, anything further than, oh yeah, like you do, question, wonderful, yeah, great, let's give it to people, or let's take it. Um, but it's, it's being shown to be really, really useful from an inflammation and immune perspective. Um, and again, you know, having multiple different mechanisms of action allows it to not just kind of target and overwhelm one specific pathway, but it can support the body through multiple different things. And it's quite easy to source from the diet as well. So up in quercetin as a baseline um, is really beneficial. And one thing that I wasn't aware of um, is its direct role, as you can see here, in um, lipid peroxidation. So again, if you do have somebody who is at risk of cardiovascular illness, or they have high oxidative stress in the pres presence of chronic inflammation, then quercetin could just be um, a bit of a, a wonder nutrient to add in there. So moving on then to this sort of concept of combination therapies. So we know that the body is highly, highly complex and there's never just one pathway to get to where you're going. You know, inflammation isn't just eicosanoids. It's not just NF-kappa B. There's so many different factors at play in every single biological process. And so it goes without saying, perhaps, that then the single or even dual nutrient interventions are not really going to work because there's so many other factors to think about when you're considering a clinical approach. Before I went into specialised in nutrition, I used to work as a cancer research scientist for AstraZeneca. Um, don't shoot me for that. And I, um, I was developing... DNA strand break repair therapies. And the reason we could develop those is because in healthy cells, when the DNA strands are broken, there are multiple different mechanisms by which those cells can repair. However, in cancer cells, they have only one or two functioning DNA strand break repair mechanisms. So the other mechanisms were dysfunctional Therefore, if you targeted the only functional ones, you could kill off the cells. And it's the same situation body-wide. Every process, if something isn't functioning optimally, to some extent, there's always an alternative. Obviously, if you're chronically inflamed and um, nutrient deficient, ultimately you'll exhaust all of those different options. But there's so many different factors that you need to think about. And so these combination therapies we're starting to see are having a huge potential in terms of having a really positive impact, as well as um, finally giving us some headlines that we can work with rather than feeling like we're constantly firefighting against our clients who are going oh but I read that fish oils were rubbish and I heard that antioxidants could kill me so it's single nutrient high doses at the wrong time that's problematic whereas these lovely studies are now coming out that show that a broad spectrum blend still specific for the specific um, condition and dysfunction are significantly better um, at helping us to overcome this this clinical paradox of well it should work but it doesn't seem to so first one here, um, anti-inflammatory effects of low doses of curcumin in combination with DHA and EPA. And this was a really nice little study because it showed that the combination of these two nutrients was really, 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 really potent in terms of its anti-inflammatory impact. It wasn't toxic and actually the lower doses were really beneficial in suppressing pro-inflammatory mechanisms. So specifically, if you look down here, um, very low doses of curcumin with DHA or EPA, so just generally omega-3, was synergistically able to express lipopolysaccharide-induced prostaglandin E2, which is one of our main pro-inflammatory arachidonic acid-derived eicosanoids. We were also able to show that the combinations were found to suppress INOS, COX, LOX, and phospholipase A2, which are the enzymes that 
convert arachidonic acid into pro-inflammatory antioxidants. So really nice kind of double whammy synergistic um, approach. And they conclude the study clearly shows the synergistic anti-inflammatory as well as antioxidative stress effects of curcumin with polyunsaturated fatty acids. And then this was another similar study using the combination of curcumin with um, omega-3 fatty acids to look at pancreatic um, and carcinoma cells, specifically in terms of inhibiting interferon gamma production. And they found that curcumins with fatty acids and antioxidants um, on pancreatic cancer was a really positive thing and that they want to further investigate this. So this was a really early kind of in vitro study, but the, the combination of the two um, nutrients was able to significantly benefit the inflammatory uh, pathways. Now, this is quite interesting because I've sort of alluded to this briefly and I don't want to go into it too much today, but basically, um, what we're seeing with a lot of nutrients is that there's a an absorption problem there's a, a reactivity problem but specifically with antioxidants we need to be making sure that um, they are able to support one another so when an antioxidant is spent if it's not mocked up and supported by another antioxidant it has the capacity to become a pro-oxidant itself so by putting these highly bioavailable micro encapsulation to support optimal absorption and activity nutrients together they were able to show a significant benefit to both the stability and the activity and the um, potential outcomes of these nutrients. So there's just a few more headlines showing um, what's going on out there in the world of research and all of these lovely um, combinations that are starting to be shown to be particularly beneficial for people with various different conditions and ailments. So we're coming to the end, finally. Um, just a couple of other things I just want to kind of throw in to make sure that um, the full picture is being addressed. We've obviously got to get to the root cause. If you're not addressing the initial trigger, regardless of how much wonderful nutrient intervention you throw at someone, you're never going to be able to, to figure out what's going on and and to really arrest it completely so finding those triggers addressing mediators to make sure that all of the different factors that are adding to and increasing oxidative stress and inflammatory load are dealt with addressed and managed and of course we need to be supporting collateral damage so as i mentioned specifically with oxidative stress and lipid peroxidation they can wander off and walk all over the body and the same happens with inflammation. If it's going on too long, it can become systemic. Inflammation can be triggered left, right and center. So we need to be dealing with all of the systems under stress, all of the problems that we're potentially up against. And again, this is where we're sort of, you know, constantly battling against our clients to get them away from the magic bullet mentality and understanding that, you know, rebuilding your body is like building a house. It takes the right time, the right materials, the right materials at the right times and in the right amounts for them. And, you know, occasionally a wall might fall down or you might decide to move your wall or you might decide you don't like the, the wallpaper that you bought. And so things need to be changed and modified um, and until you get to that sort of baseline of optimal health and well-being again so exploration and playing detective is absolutely vital so what can we take home from this um, an awful lot has been thrown at you today i appreciate that so i will be emailing the slides out to you with this recording if you want to watch it back but basically things to just have in mind as you're moving forward and starting to hopefully put some of this into practice if you're not already, is human beings are multi-system organisms and those systems are all interconnected. They all relate to one another. If one cog breaks, it doesn't just require that cog to be replaced. There's gonna be cracks, dents, chips, weakenings in other cogs and 
it's about putting all of those pieces back together and addressing all of those potential dysfunctions and irregularities that have arisen as a result of that one initial cog cracking. The complexity of our biological processes is still not fully understood, particularly in terms of how they relate and impact one another. So it makes sense that we need to be taking a multi-pronged approach to diseases and dysfunction if we really want to see positive impact. These one nutrient interventions are not going to be the be all and end all. We're not seeing the panaceas of health that we are expecting from a lot of these nutrient interventions and that's because there's more than one pathway and more than one system being impacted at any one time. So it's important to really get to grips with the mechanisms of action of not only the pathogenesis of disease but also the nutrients that you're using and understanding the importance of the individual approach and understanding how the variation from person to person in response is going to heavily impact um, therapeutic success. So in terms of a summary for a plan of action, you want to know your environment. Is there oxidative stress? Is there inflammation? How bad it is? What nutrients are we lacking? What things are contributing or exacerbating these issues? And is there anything that we can directly remove to deal with this? What condition are you looking at? What's the specific dysfunction in the specific system that you're working with? And then go back to the research and understand what interventions can be applied to specifically address those areas. Testing to identify the need of the client, but also the severity of the situation. To some extent, that can help you to prioritize. You know, you can't do everything all at once. You've got to understand what order you're going to be addressing things in. So testing can help you as much as it can help them obviously if you can convince them to do it lay down the foundations of optimal health modify diet lifestyle eliminate stress i don't need to tell you guys about this um, and then of course use those targeted proven interventions for the specific dysfunctions and ailments that you're addressing make sure at all times your if you don't exactly know what impact or what situation you're dealing with, that you go in with a safe, low health enhancing dose, but not necessarily hardcore therapeutic dose initially. Prop the body up, support it, support multiple systems, and then drill down into the specific intense areas of support that you need later. Choosing high bioavailable and highly highly bioavailable and high quality nutritional supplements when you're using them is essential making sure that the ingredient that you're taking is actually getting to where you want it to go in the active form is vital um, and of course co-supplementation and diet modification to support the bigger picture so all of the systems that are under stress and strain and all of the mediators and contributing factors that are going on there and obviously long-term management once the body is primed to react it will so it's about management and and management of expectation of the client as well is that you know this is a life change not just uh, take supplements for three months and you'll be cured kind of thing so just to kind of highlight a few of our products that you might or might not be aware of already we've got farming per restore and maintain which are are our therapeutic omega-3 fish oils. Farmipa Restore is pure EPA, whereas Maintain contains EPA, DHA, GLA, and vitamin D for extra immune support. Then we've got um, our super bioavailable, amazing Vesisorb, Ubiquinol, and Long Vida Curcumin, which are by far the most researched in terms of quality bioavailability and stability forms of these nutrients available on the market. And then I just threw in Mind Care Protect there, just as a little um, aside almost, but this is a really lovely intervention that can be used as a baseline support. There's an omega-3 fish oil with um, 800 and 
60 milligrams of EPA plus DHA, there's vitamin D in there, 1000 IU, there's a full B vitamin complex, micronutrients to support the antioxidant enzymes, so you've got zinc, selenium, um, magnesium, vitamin C, another antioxidant, and then this is a really lovely antioxidant blend. So you've got n acetyl L cysteine, alpha lipoic acid, and resveratrol. So if you're not sure where to start, um, and there's a little bit of okay, everything's coming at me, how do I begin? Then this can be a really lovely um, intervention to just kind of prop people up whilst you delve a bit deeper, wait for your test results, understand exactly what's going on um, and just make sure that they've got some support in place. So that's it. Thank you for sticking with me. I appreciate there's been a lot of information there. Um, we will, as I say, email out the slides and the recording to everybody within a few days. If you have any questions, queries, concerns, then please don't hesitate to get in touch. Um, and I look forward to receiving any questions either now by the chat or the Q&A, or um, you can email me at that email address, sophietigenis.com. I don't see any questions popping up right now. So do please feel free to get in touch with myself or Nina. And if you um, have any problems accessing the um, slides, etc., down the line, then you know where we are. Have a lovely day, everybody. Thank you for sticking with me. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all again soon.